Hey everyone, welcome back to Add to Your Faith Ministry Synoptic Gospel Study. Today we are doing lesson 103. This is a very interesting lesson to me because it's about the anointing of Christ. Um, now on our chart it just has the Luke passage. Um, I'm going to discuss all of the anointings of Christ. There are three different anointings. Um, and I want to, to talk about that and the significance of that as we're here at um, Easter um, season and looking at the timing of those anointings as well, just how important this is and just really interesting stuff. Um, what's extra interesting and unexpected is that this was also Santos's sermon topic today. He focused on the John anointing, the book of John's anointing, and it's just really interesting that I come home and found out that this is what I'm teaching tonight as well. So we're just getting a lot of this today. Um, I hope that all of you here in Korea who heard the sermon this morning will be um, encouraged by the extension of that lesson that we'll be looking at uh, with our study tonight. Now, um, as I said, this is several different passages and there are different anointings that are being discussed. Now that's a point of confusion for a lot of people um, because two of them happen in houses where the owner was named Simon and the, the women that did it is one is Mary, the others are unnamed. In some Jesus' head's anointed and some his feet's anointed. So I've got some really good articles that I've been reading on the differences between these things and one just really stood out to me um, that I'm going to talk about. Um, as well as just compare these passages with you. Um, when we do a synoptic gospel study, this is one of the most important things is recognizing what things are synoptic and what things are not in the sense of what is the same story being told from different perspectives and what's actually different stories that have similar elements to them. Now, um, there's a lot of debate on these and there's a lot of different research, so it's hard to know sometimes which um, is the most authentic um, research, but I've really tried to narrow it down to some things that are very, I think, um, useful information for us. And you can do your own research on this and determine if you agree with this um, conclusion or not. But I, I hope that however we go about it, we really can learn some things from these anointings of Christ and the women who did them. So, all right, let's start with the Luke passage. Luke chapter 7. We'll start in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him, being Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him, at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisees who had invited him, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, um... This is very early in Christ's ministry. This one is not in the same timeline as the other ones, which are going to happen around um, the Passover. But this one is the one that's in our chart today, so we're going to start with that one. Now, just the few points of this story that I want to get before I start comparing all the stories. Since the stories are different but similar, I want to do each story individually, okay? So in this one, Jesus goes to a Pharisee's house for dinner and... Um, 
things that didn't happen. We're going to kind of go through the story out of place. When Jesus came to the house, the homeowner did not wash his feet, um, anoint with oil, do any of the things that were culturally normal. Now, why were these things culturally normal? Remember that in Israel, people walked everywhere. Uh, traditionally, they wore sandals. Um, roads were not paved. So we have these dirt roads where people are walking all day long in the heat. When you would go to someone's home for dinner, they would give you a bowl of water uh, where you that was um, often had oil in the water, like an essential oil, often um, oils that make it smell good because your feet would stink, right? <laughs> they didn't have like antibacterial soap then. So um, these uh, essential oils could purify um, as well as washes. We've learned back again in modern days, we're learning to return to essential oils for cleansing. Um, so again, they would have this bowl of water with an essential oil in it and you could wash your feet so that they would be purified and and clean after walking in the dirt all day before you came into the person's house. You don't want to bring dirty feet into the house, right? Um, and so it was both a way to offer refreshing as well as you know, it was hygienic and clean. It's like giving somebody some hand sanitizer before you go into the house. Um, this was something the servants would do if the house was a rich house so that um, you were like treated nicely. Um, they did a service for you. Um, now, when Jesus came to the Pharisee's house, they didn't do this, uh, which is strange. The Pharisee would have been very wealthy, um, which usually he's having a huge banquet. Lots of people are there. Obviously people that he didn't really invite. So it's like a city wide banquet most likely and yet he does not provide the basic cultural things um, for everyone to have clean feet so you got a lot of people in their house walking around with dirty feet um which is not not a nice picture right he didn't he wasn't being a good host and so jesus points that out to him um but let's get back so what happens instead is a woman of the city who was a sinner okay um this most people believe implies that she was a prostitute using those two phrases a woman of the city and a prostitute now this is not um, mary magdalene or mary of bethany um, there's no name here there's no mary okay this is a different person a different event um, and mary of bethany and mary magdalene were not prostitutes mary magdalene was a demoniac she had she was possessed by demons but not a prostitute and Mary of Bethany was not known as a sinner. Uh, her reputation was a very pious woman. So you have this woman who is a prostitute, most likely a woman of the city and a sinner, um, who, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, so that means that she found out that Jesus was there at that place. And so she went there with this alabaster, alabaster, can't say that word alabaster box or flask depending on how it's interpreted uh, avoidment now again the this woman arrives at the house on purpose to anoint Christ that's why she was there it's not like she was just like you know hanging out in this house and happened to have this very expensive ointment in her pocket she went there on purpose to do this thing uh, we'll talk more about the um alabaster box and the nard in a minute but first of all let's keep reading so and standing behind him at his feet now how does that work standing behind someone at their feet um in in this culture that was greatly influenced by the greek culture at this point in time people would recline at table as is mentioned which means they kind of like had couches around the tables and they would uh, if you've seen the reclining couches like especially like the Greek art and stuff that one side have a curled pillow. I don't have my camera up to see what, if you can see this case. Yes, you can see my arm. Uh, there's a curled pillow and, um, on that they would like be able to rest an elbow and then they would have recline with their feet to one side and then they would eat with their other hand. Um, so you have Jesus laying on this sofa at this table. That's called reclining at table. We see that phrase often in scripture. So she comes up behind him at his feet. All right. So his feet, he's, he's facing the table. So she walks up behind him down at his feet to anoint him. Now, um, weeping. Okay. So she's weeping and she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and then anointed them with the ointment. Okay. So, we, we see her 
she's repented of her sins. She knows who Christ is. And in her repentance, she is weeping over her sins. The, she's weeping so much that there's enough water to wash the dirt off of Jesus's feet. But, you know, they're, they're, they're getting wet. And so she uses her hair to wipe them. Now, it is interesting that her hair is available to use. Um, Santos was mentioning his sermon this morning that the culture considered women not to unbind their hair. Their hair should be up and covered with a veil in the culture at that, at that time. And for her to have her hair down to even wipe Jesus's feet uh, would imply that, again, the idea of prostitution, because it was only the women of low morals who had their hair down. Uh, so her hair was down uh, and available to wipe his feet. Um, so now later we'll look at when Mary does it and it was a different situation with her using her hair. Um, but you know, that's a, uh, what's the word? Supposition, uh, an assumption because of the culture that would have looked down on her having her hair down. If she's a prostitute, no one cares her hair's down because that's, you know, a mark of her, um, of her sinfulness, which I think is so interesting because that was kind of her symbol of prostitution. If we say, you know, having her hair uncovered and down and using that to wipe Christ's feet, you know, that sense of like the thing that had been her symbol of her immorality and of her, like being a part of the sex trade, like she's using that to clean the feet of Christ. Like, I feel like that's a very repentant, um, symbol for her that she's letting her hair have this like service to Christ almost like it's redeeming it. Like I, I really like, I like that aspect of, um, that what that symbol would have meant to her to, to be doing that. Now, um, you notice that this just says an alabaster, alabaster flask of ointment. It does not say nard, uh, in this and other stories we're going to look at today, they use specifically the essential oil nard, but in this one, it does not say that it was just an alabaster box of ointment. And we're going to look at a quote in a minute about that, but let's keep going. So now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him for she's a sinner. Um, it's interesting to me that in this story, as well as the one of Mary and Bethany, um, you have someone going, what are you doing? All right. This real negative reaction. Um, the Pharisee sees this woman doing this and instead of, can, he doesn't condemn her. Um, like Mary of Bethany gets condemned, but in this one, the, this story, the Pharisee doesn't condemn the woman, but he condemns Christ. If you had known how evil she was, you wouldn't let her touch you and be doing this. Um, so it was a very like condescending tone in his mind to Christ. And so Jesus answered him with a parable. Um, Jesus is what his like MO is his style of teaching is to use stories, um, to help people see something. Uh, often in scripture, this is used. If you think about when David had killed Uriah after having an affair with Bathsheba, and Samuel came and told him the very pitiful story of a man whose lamb was stolen and everything. And David was like, I'm going to get that man. And Samuel was like, you are that man. Um, this is similar where Jesus takes stories because stories, we can stay distant from them and just hear the story itself without being defensive or anything. And then you realize, wow, that's, that's showing me, right? So that's what Jesus does. And he tells the story about how you have two people. If one person is forgiven a small debt, Another person is forgiven a big debt. Who's going to be more grateful? And the Pharisee rightly said, well, someone who had the bigger debt's going to be more grateful. Um, and that's what Jesus's point was. He said, this woman, do you see this woman? Um, so he, he's making a point that um, she had been forgiven a lot. He knew she was a sinner. He knew what she had done. That wasn't the point. She loved a lot. She loved Christ. She was repenting of her sins. And he said that because he was forgiving her so much, that's why she was so grateful and that she should not be looked down on for, for that. And for this, you know, kind of, um, extravagant act of worship, um, so public and so, um, defiant of culture to come into somebody else's house and to wash someone's feet with your sobbing face and then clean him up with your unbound hair and to anoint him with an oil, like all these things that she's doing. And 
in that, this to me, this is a very public act of repentance. Everyone knew that she was a sinner, and she's coming forward to publicly um, act out this worship and this repentance and this sacrifice for Christ. Um, this ointment is very expensive, and for her to use it on Christ is that sense of surrender and sacrificing something that is valuable um, to her. Um, very valuable and use it as an offering for Christ um, to put that on him and in that sense of repentance and faith and sacrifice publicly saying I don't want to be this a prostitute anymore I want to identify with Christ publicly let everyone see that I am here to repent at his feet um, I mean, this is more than most people are doing at this time in Jesus's ministry, where they're just kind of watching him as a teacher and letting him kind of heal them and stuff. Like she is throwing herself before Christ on her face, literally at his feet, kissing his feet, anointing his feet, sacrificing herself to him and saying, I repent of my sins publicly. Um, and Christ recognizes that love that she has and says, someone who's been forgiven of so much is going to be like this. They're going to really be able to love deeply and to sacrifice greatly and to worship openly. Like, um, that's a sign of how much she has been loved and how much she's loving God. And whereas someone who's been forgiven for very little, um, or doesn't realize how much they've been forgiven for, which is more the reality, um, they're not going to have that same deep worship. Um, so I've heard some people like teach the wrong thing here where they're like, so people who have sinned more can worship better. That's not the point. The point is when you realize how much you've been forgiven from, then you can truly worship. All of us are sinners. All sin is evil. Um, we are all desperately wicked. Whenever we think that we're good, that itself is a sin because we are not good. We're just prideful and blind. Um, when you recognize who you are, when you can see your sin and truly forsake it and confess it and worship Christ, then you're going to be filled with this kind of awe-inspiring worship where you're willing to walk into the middle of a banquet and just throw yourself at Christ's feet, giving him gifts and, and weeping over your sins um, without being concerned about what other people are thinking. So like Jesus uses this to teach and says, um, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water. Now, what it, what's so interesting is I've already mentioned this, but he doesn't condemn the woman for her public display like Simon wants her to, or not Simon, this is not Simon, as the Pharisee wants her to, but instead, um, he starts rebuking him for being a bad host, for breaking the culture, for not being kind. It's like, you didn't provide me water. You didn't do all the stuff that's supposed to do, but she's not stopped doing it since she walked into the house. Um, so you see this woman, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with your tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. Uh, now kissing was a way of greeting. This is not like a romantic kiss. Uh, it was a sign of welcome and like, if you've been in Europe, you know, like they'll kiss on the face as a greeting, that sense of you are welcome here. Like I, I am greeting you like with a handshake or, you know, like in some cultures, like a kiss. He's like, you didn't do that. So Simon brought Jesus into his house for a dinner, but he didn't wash his feet. He didn't greet him. He didn't do any of the right stuff and said, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Um, again, another practice would have been to anoint the hair with oil when you came in. Um, and I think some of that was about, again, the hygienic aspect, like giving um, the smell be positive. But also the other side um, is traditionally certain kind of head ointments was to recognize someone as savior. Uh, well, not savior, recognize someone as priest or king. And of course, Jesus as savior. But Simon does not recognize that position that Christ has, but she has not you know, stopped anointing him. So therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. All right, so again, the people's response is so negative and so condescending. Jesus is saving this woman. And he tells her that your sins are forgiven. They're like, well, who do you think you are to forgive people? And they do not recognize him as savior. She does. And so he says to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So he tells of this woman, he says that she loved greatly, that she served him completely, and that her faith is what saved her. And that 
he's forgiven her. She can go in peace. She no longer needs to be weeping uh, over her repentance, but to go peacefully because God sees her love and sees her faith. I mean, what a beautiful passage, right? This conversion of this prostitute who falls at the feet of Christ, confessing her sins publicly. It's beautiful. Now, this, the sad thing is, is that this passage is often confused with other anointings that Christ had. Now, I read one article that I, I thought made a really good point. And that was that since anointings happened, every time you went to someone's house, you had your feet washed, your head, or your, it was either oil in the water um, for that, or they would anoint your head with oil. This kind of an anointing was every meal. So the fact that there's multiple anointings in scripture is not odd. We don't have to try to make them all one anointing just because it's women doing it. And because it is women doing it, sometimes we're like, there's probably only one woman who anointed Christ. It must be one story, but one that's limiting God in a lot of ways, because it's saying that why would multiple women be worshiping God? That's not the kind of question we need to be asking. We need to recognize that it's not strange that there's different stories of women anointing Christ. And each one's a little bit different, which is so important because people be like, oh, well, the Bible must be wrong. This one, it says foot. This one, it says head. What? Instead of just recognizing that these are different stories, different times that God used women to anoint Christ as a testimony in some way. Um, so it's, it's really important. I just feel so strongly about that, that as a woman, you know, one that, you know, when men do different things, like, well, men talk to Christ. Well, there's already another story where a man talked to Christ, so must be the same story. Like, no one says that. But because similar events are happening where women come and anointing Christ with precious ointment, that that must be one event. And I think very clearly that it is not just one event, um, that several events that happened for different reasons. This first one we did is the most earliest, the most earliest, <laughs> I speak English, the earliest one um, because... As I said, this is about the repentance and faith of a, of a woman who is not anointing Christ to identify him with his death, which is what the later ones are, um, but is anointing him as a sacrifice in her surrender to him as a part of her salvation. So that is a different event. Now let's look at the other ones. So uh, turn to um, Matthew uh, chapter 26. We're going to read these. Matthew chapter, you know, instead of using the computer, I'm just going to flip over here in my Bible because that'll be quicker than trying to load everything. All right. All right. Matthew 26, verse 6. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. All right, so that's the first one. Um, let's hop over to John chapter 11. Look in verse 28. Oh, sorry, wrong one. John chapter 12, verse 1. Okay. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Okay, now... Look at Mark, chapter 14, I'm 
starting at verse 3. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than three hundred denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And, the, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Okay, so we have... We have these three stories of this anointing of Christ. So let's look at, um, let me find, I want to look, uh, I have some different references um, that I want to read to you before we talk about that. Sorry, I have the, I'm having trouble finding my, here we go. All right. Um, now, this is talking about what is this alabaster box and this ointment. Um, this is from a website um, that's actually quoting a book. So the quote is from Kendall, Jackie, and Debbie Jones from Lady in Waiting, Becoming God's Best While Waiting for Mr. Right. That's a really long title. But anyway, she's um, quoting their research um, in that book about the alabaster box. Um, so I'm going to read that. I'm sure some of you um, have heard of this book. I'm not trying to go into depth about the book, but I remember that it had a way of describing the alabaster box and what it truly was, that up until now I never gave much thought to. During the biblical times, when a young woman arrived at the age to marry, her family would buy an alabaster box for her and fill it with ointment. The size of the box and the value of the ointment was to display the amount of wealth her family acquired. When a man would ask her for her, what? When a man would ask for her to marry him, uh, she would respond by breaking this precious box at his feet. Moreover, the expensive ointment on his feet was meant to show him honor. So when Mary decided to break her alabaster box to Jesus, it's not that she was expected to marry him, but it was a sign of honor. Um, now, another point on the alabaster box. Um, The connotation behind the alabaster box can probably be seen in many different lights. In addition, when doing some research on the important chest, I found that it was actually made of marble stone. That is in some way dangerous when you think about a woman breaking the alabaster box. How difficult it must have been to break marble. In this particular article, I also found the liquid inside the box that was either described as a perfume or ointment was said to contain a particular element. Myrrh is a white liquid that flows from a tree in Africa and Arabia and was the main ingredient in the oil. As we read in text that Jesus was crucified, the ointment was used by those who would die by death of crucifixion. Okay, so um, in these in these things, you're just talking about what the alabaster box was and the different ointments that were used. So just to kind of expand on that a little bit, um, what I take away from this is every woman had this alabaster box, this tradition of giving her this marble or um, alabaster box that would be filled with as an and expensive of oil as the family could afford. Um, essential oils in this day were money. Um, this is how they showed their value. And so whatever they could afford to buy would be the level of income displayed, um, like not really a dowry, but more of a, um, I don't know, like it's a completely different kind of tradition. But um, as she said, the concept was that Every young woman who's getting to that eligible age will be given this box of oil. And when she has met the man that she wants to commit to, um, like instead of doing like an engagement ring style, instead they would take this box as a submission and break it at the man's feet. Like that couldn't be taken back. Uh, once that's poured out, it's poured out. We're done. You are the person, right? The money that would be invested was saying the family was investing in this man and saying, I will take you into 
my my family i i submit to you and honor you okay um now we think about all every woman having one of these again that helps explain why there's different stories about the anointings happening because there were different boxes in every family um so especially in in this we see that um was my in luke as she broke the box um, as she broke the box at the feet of Christ and poured out all of her oil now this is different in the in the first story that we looked at um, she took some oil from her box and anointed his feet but it doesn't say that she poured it all out and doesn't say that she broke it but at this stage Mary breaks the box um, and all of the oil is given to Christ her complete symbol of all of her wealth um kind of her selling point as a single female um all of it was being broken and and sacrificed to the feet of christ um i mean it's just such a a beautiful submission and surrender and honoring that everything she had for her future to be able to honor a man she would wanted to honor christ with that um, everything that she had for hope for her marriage instead of hoping for something earthly she wanted to sacrifice that as a gift to christ i mean it's just understanding what that box symbolized to her is such a it gives more depth to that story and understanding what was happening right all right so now i have another really cool article i found that explained about the different um symbols in the anointings um Okay, so I'm going to read this. This is from um, Andy Wop of Medium.com. Summary of the three anointings. Early in Jesus' ministry, an unnamed woman at the home of Simon, who was a wealthy Pharisee, anointed his feet with ointment and wiped his feet with hair. That's the Luke passage. And then Beth, Beth, blah, blah. Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with hair on the ninth day of Nisan. The next day, on the 10th of Nisan, the day the sacrificial lambs were to be chosen, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the sacrificial lamb of God, which was Palm Sunday, which is happening this Sunday, there for all to see and judge his perfection. An unnamed woman anointed Jesus' head at the home of Simon the leper in Bethany two days before the Passover, the 13th day of Nisan, Matthew 26, 1 to 16, and Mark 14, 1 to 11. Okay, so we have the Luke passage, and then we have the Mary of Bethany passage, which is in Matthew and Mark. And then we have the John passage. Now the differences between, which is Mary of Bethany is done. And so the in Matthew and Mark, it may be Mary of Bethany, it may not be, but it's definitely Mary of Bethany in John. All right, so in these passages, um, on the ninth day of Nisan, you have the first anointing. And on the 13th day of Nisan, you have the, uh, the second anointing. So why does that matter? Um, I'm going to read this because like they just really have written it well and I just want to read this. So let me make sure I start at the right place. Yes, okay. Passover lambs were chosen six days in advance. This allowed them to be brought in, often into the family home, and inspected for five days. They were inspected to ensure that they were free from blemish, including the legs, ankles, and feet, as they were easily damaged or marked in the rocky hillsides. At this point, they would take anointing oil and rub it into the ankles and feet prior to them being inspected for a further five days. All right, so uh, it's emphasized in this passage that um, six days before the Passover is when she does this. So for everyone, the Jewish people who understood the Passover tradition, that the Passover lamb's feet were anointed with oil as a part of the inspection process of proving them um, to be the right lamb to be used for Passover. So in that, Jesus is being identified as the Passover lamb. Um, let's keep reading. So six days before the Passover, Jesus is at someone's house in Bethany, and he's anointed for burial by having pure nard rubbed on his feet and ankles. That was his first anointing prior to his crucifixion. The second anointing happens two days before Passover. The Passover lamb was anointed the second time on their head to announce that they were free from disease or blemish. This is in contrast to the first time, which was on their feet six days before. The head of Jesus was anointed two days before he was crucified and was a sign that he was well without sickness or defect. 
The first Passover lamb anointing was on the feet six days before Passover. The second anointing was on the head two days before. And then the Passover lambs were sacrificed on Passover, which is Nisan day 14, from the ninth hour. We read that following his second anointing, Jesus and the twelve disciples returned to Jerusalem from Bethany on the next day to partake of the Passover meal. This was followed by his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. The following day, when Jesus died around the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., which was the same afternoon that the Passover lambs were killed. Now, I mean, this is just so fantastic that um, understanding that the Passover lamb is... We know that Jesus in his crucifixion is uh, had been represented throughout Jewish history with this Passover lamb. Um, remember Passover, Exodus, um, when the death angel was coming um, to kill those who did not um, believe in God, who did not submit to the blood being put on their doorposts, and the firstborn of every family was to be killed. And anyone who had the blood on the doorpost, the death angel would pass over, and they ate the Passover meal every year after that to celebrate God rescuing Israel and then eventually the exodus that happened because of the Passover. Now, um, Jesus is identified all through scripture as the Passover lamb. So then when we realize the tradition, um, the, the process of anointing the Passover lamb with oil on his feet six days before and on his head two days before um, as a part of the process of proving and uh, identifying the lamb for the Passover that Jesus was going through that process through these anointings. I mean, it's just beautiful. Like what's happening there that these women are being used by God to identify Christ as the Passover lamb, as the Messiah before he goes to the cross, before any of them know everything that's going to happen. They are identifying him through this obviously Holy Spirit moment. And as this happens, we have this expensive ointment that's being put on Christ. Um, and we have the box of alabaster just being completely broken and given to Christ. Like in both of these, there's such surrender. There's such sacrifice because these women are using these oils that were theirs as their, you know, like passage into matrimony. Um, they would have been. The, we know specifically that when Mary of Bethany did it, uh, it was one pound of nard, which is um, interesting. You know, the Judas gets mad about it. And he's like, that could have been sold for all these denarii. That was like at least a year's wage. So, you know, like in today's world, what most people make like minimum around 20000 a year um, up to like, what's an average person salary? 30000 a year. Okay. So if we say that this box of perfumes were $30,000, just a year's salary, okay? And she, it is her gift from her family to allow her to be committed to marriage, $30,000 investment here. She breaks it and pours it all out as an anointing of Christ, God-led anointing because she is being used by God to identify Christ as the Passover lamb. In her process, she is worshiping him. She is honoring him. From biblical perspective, she is being used by God to identify him as that Passover lamb. I mean, it's just so glorious just how that is that that worship and that um, thorough and complete surrender of everything they are to completely worship Christ. We see the first woman doing it as a point of salvation. We see these two women at Bethany or possibly Mary uh, of Bethany doing it twice, but she broke her. So it was probably two different women, one anointing the head, one anointing the feet, but they were both at the house in it, Simon of Bethany, the leper house. Um, and so you have this you know, idea of this big feast is going on. There's lots of people there. And over this time period on day six before Passover and day two before Passover, these two women bringing their ointment, their precious essential oil that represents everything for them and pouring that on the feet of Christ. As we think about what that means for us um, and what we are called to in complete submission and complete surrender of everything that we are, everything that's important to us, um, you know, we have to ask, are we breaking our alabaster box? Are we willing to pour out everything that we have for Christ? Um, are we completely surrendered to worship him and to honor him with everything that we are and everything that we have? And 
you know, when we do that, then the way Christ speaks of these women, that they are preparing him for burial, that he knows what it symbolizes, that no man should rebuke them for them being lavish and extravagant and just throwing everything at Christ because that was a worship that he accepted and he respected what they were doing because he knew it was a part of the process um, and that it was a preparation for his burial, that he was headed out to die. They would not see him again until after his resurrection. And again, many of these Marys were the ones who were at the tomb to anoint his dead body when they got to see him alive. These women have such an important role in everything going around Christ with the crucifixion and the resurrection. And sometimes they get missed in these stories. I just think it's so important that we recognize, just like Jesus said, that as long as his story is told, that the story of what this woman did would be told as well. And so it's important that that happens because it's what Christ wanted. All right, this video has already went too long because I'm covering such a big topic. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. But if you have any thoughts or questions, please feel free to email me um, at addtoyourfaithministries at gmail.com or message on this video. Um, the comments are open where you can comment on this video or send me a message privately. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on how this has encouraged you or how it's challenged you in some way. All right, God bless. Bye-bye.